I think entrepreneurship is not a destination. Entrepreneurship is a journey. I always say, if you don't read, you can't lead. I think leadership for me is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. They say information is power, but I always believe it is information that is applied. Knowledge. They say knowledge is power, but this knowledge actually needs to be applied. We want to make sure that the face of technology should not be the face of a particular color. We want to make sure that when you mention technology, you can as well be in technology being black. I can also be in technology being white. The leaders who came before us, what did they do? What lessons can we learn from them? And how can we leave this place, the world, a better place than the one we found? Entrepreneurship is not sexy. Entrepreneurship is not what we see in Hollywood movies. Entrepreneurship is real life. And this life has ups. This life has downs. Your professional journey should be about the process. It should not really be just about the money you want to make. So I'm your host, Gaurav Garg, and we welcome all our viewers to our show, Amazing Mentor. Today with us is Mr. Johnny. He founded the Pan African Chamber of Commerce in 2015. He has over 15 years of experience in media, entertainment, entrepreneurship, trade, social impact, and human rights. He is a global thought leader with a proven track record to lead multicultural teams and deliver outstanding results and has an in-depth understanding of business networking, negotiations, relationship, and project management. Johnny's work is inspired by his responsibility to culture, equity, diversity, and inclusion. He has a special ability in connecting entrepreneur vision, creative passion, and innovative problem solving. Johnny offers a broad range of professional service to artists, corporations, universities, and governments. He is a member of the World Trade Organization, International Chamber of Commerce Committee on Media and Small Enterprises Advisory Committee. He is also the founder of Women Entrepreneurship Center, the South African Film and Television Academy. The American Art of Chamber of Commerce has offices in South Africa, New York, Mississippi, Georgia and California. It's a pleasure to welcome Mr. Johnny to our show, Amazing Mentor. Welcome, Johnny. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. My pleasure. So we'll right away start from your student life. So tell us how was you as a student? As a student, I had the passion really to excel. Something that I do quite well is that when I put my mind to something, I do it to the best of my ability. So I was a very, very committed student. I really enjoyed my time in the classroom. I enjoyed literally going to school because I loved learning. So I was a very diligent, committed student and basically it shows in terms of how I was made to jump two grades twice. So what about your childhood memory? When I say childhood, what that, what's that one memory that strikes your mind? My childhood memory really, because I grew up in a very big family. My father had two wives. So I grew up surrounded by so many people. So when you grow up, uh, around so many people like that, the memories are of the full house, right? This full house where there was fun, where there was joy, uh, but also where disagreement, especially with bigger brothers who wanted to kind of dictate what you should do. I remember trying to become friends with my brother's friends, and he said to me, No, you cannot be, you are too young, you are younger than me, so my friends should not be uh, your friends. So, I grew up around, on my mother's side, there's eight of us. I was the last born. On the other side, the other stepmother, uh, she also had about 10 children or so. It was really a very exciting time growing up. Our father, the memories I have of him, a provider, you know, with so many children, but he was always out there and he is really my role model. So I grew up surrounded by love, surrounded by this big family. And it also taught me selflessness because when you grow up around so many people like that, you are not even allowed to be selfish. Many, many other uh, cousins also grew up in our, in our household. You know, there was so much love around. That is the memory I had. So was there any teacher who had particularly strong influence on your life? There was a teacher, I think, in grade four. He was just passionate. He was teaching us French, actually. And when he was removed from our school to another school, my early memory at that time, we went to protest. I think my first memory of protesting was when this T 
teacher we all love was removed from our school and sent to another school in another province far from where we were. He was a very, very good influence. He loved French literature. And that love of French literature was also shared now with us. So he is actually the person who helped develop in me the culture of reading. He would actually make you travel in your mind without having left the place where you found yourself. Uh, I don't even remember how old I was. But that is the man who was teaching us French literature, who really played a very critical role in my growth of loving French literature, French culture. I still read. I still read. And this is something that came from this teacher when I was actually in grade four. So tell us about your educational background in schooling and higher education. So my education background, in Congo, there is a French system where you study six years of uh, primary school and then you go to high school, six years as well of high school. But when you get into high school, you are able to choose a career path. I chose agriculture and it was really, really exciting. That is basically what I did the whole of high school. So when I finished, I then started just doing some courses and I remember as well learning to speak English. It was actually like a privilege to speak English because where I'm coming from is a French uh, speaking country. So when whenever I had the English lesson, the English teacher coming in, I, I think I've always been a very curious human being, uh, even in high school, despite the fact that I chose agriculture as, a, as, a, as an area of study. And then I did love just foreign stuff, foreign languages uh, as well. I think at some point they tried introducing Latin to us. Uh, so when I finished then high school, I did some short courses. One of those short courses was done with the university in Australia, media literacy that was funded by UNESCO. Uh, so my background really shaped the person I am today, but also because I love media so much. I'm actually in that space as a content you know, creator, as a producer, as a director. Uh, so it has really shaped the person I've become. And funny enough, I am now going back into agriculture with programs that are supporting women in Africa who want to feed this continent, by the way. Uh, so my background studying uh, agriculture in high school. I've always loved agriculture. And the idea basically for me has always been how do we how do we feed our continent? How do we feed our neighbors? How do we make sure that we can develop a an ecosystem? That's basically my education background. But I believe that there's such a thing as lifelong learning and learning doesn't stop until you die. So every day I learn from the people I lead. I also did some courses in Ethiopia 10 years ago with the Institute of Security Studies, Institute for Security Studies, where we looked at how as artists working in the space, we are able to use art as a tool for peace building. And because I'm coming from Congo, the country that has not known peace since 1997, I also see myself as a, an agent of peace in the world. So I always say you will not know that you need peace until you lose it. Um, so I've also been studying around peace and AI. We see what's happening. So there's so many things we can learn uh, every single day. And that's how I see my learning and my background. So what was your dream profession as a child? My dream profession growing up, I wanted to be a doctor. So my mother, because I was sickly as a child, she would always say he will become a doctor, that I will actually was going to become a doctor because I was always, you know, I was a sick child. And I really, I bought into that. That was actually my mother's dream for me. As you know, as parents now, we also dream for our children. So my mother was dreaming for me to become a doctor. But when I saw blood, I have to tell you that <laughs> I said, no, I don't think I should actually go into this space. Uh, so growing up, really, I wanted to be a doctor because we saw people who went away from our place, who went to become doctors, they were celebrated. They were really celebrated. So my mother was like, when you grow up, I want you to be like that guy. You know, our neighbor, the his son became a doctor. Uh, so I kept that dream for a long time until I was exposed to blood and I said, I don't think I have what it takes to be a doctor. Um, 
and then I changed, you know, as you grow up, as you're exposed to, uh, to things. Because of what I saw in our household, my father was an entrepreneur. I come from a family of entrepreneurs. I also realized that I can also become a businessman. Uh, so from moving from wanting to be a doctor to also now choosing to be a, an entrepreneur. I have been an entrepreneur actually my whole life. I started when I was actually very, very small. So from wanting to be a doctor, I wanted to be a business person. I have been a business person ever since. So who has been your biggest influence in your life? My father has always been the biggest influence in my life. He was a role model, he was a provider, and he kind of showed us what to do. Life, my siblings, the boys in our family, he would always sit us down and tell us what raising a family was like. So the most important role model in my life has been my father. But when I came to South Africa, Nelson Mandela became a role model because I read a lot about where South Africa as a nation was coming from. And if Mandela was not the leader who came in to bring about peace, South Africa as a nation would have been torn apart by civil war, uh, you know, post party. So I have two men in my life who have been role models, my father and Nelson Mandela. So would you like to share any of your favorite memory from your marriage life or about your partner? I met the mother of my kids in Port Elizabeth, which is actually a city, I think about 800 kilometers from here in China, from here, yeah, in Jobek where I am. I didn't know her in this city where, where we met, but when she moved to Johannesburg as well. She came to our church one day, she was telling a friend that, no, she saw this guy, She's like, I know this guy, I saw him before. The friends were like, you're lying, that's not true. And she then came to me and she asked, were you ever in Port Elizabeth? I said, yes, I was. Did you go to this particular church? I said, yes. Yeah, I, I used to go to this church. Were you selling like clothes along this particular road? I'm like, yes, I was selling clothes around the particular road. And so that's kind of actually the memory I have. And, but also, you know, the birth of my children, you know, I became a father in, in South Africa. I became a father for the first time ever in my life in Johannesburg, to be specific. All my children are born here. So I have those memories of being a first time father without really knowing what to do. The child was crying, who's now actually a very, very good boy now. He didn't even know what to do. Uh, so, and then my second child was born, and the last one was actually a girl. I think I've been shaped by the responsibility of being a father and raising boys is always different from raising girls. So I kind of discovered actually that even though I had experience raising these boys, when the girl was born, it was totally different. I mean, like totally different, a, a totally different human being, you know, with her own needs and a very, very different relationship, you know, with me uh, than her, her brothers, her, her two uh, older brothers. So I'm always shaped by by all of this, you know, becoming a father, uh, but also meeting somebody outside of your culture. You know, I'm coming from a different culture in the in the heart of Africa, Congo, where I'm coming from. And then I came down here to South Africa and met somebody from a different culture. So all of these things, actually, how you are dealing with, uh, with difference, actually, that's where my understanding of cultural diversity uh, started in my, in my house. I have truly Pan African household. So I've got children whose mother is from here. There's a family in South Africa. There's a family in Congo where I'm coming from. Uh, and I think all of these things also give me kind of a different look, actually, outlook on life. Uh, and that's why I think I then got very much interested in understanding the best understanding where people are coming from, but also where people are going, because we are all different in, in different ways, really. So what about your professional life? Where did you start your professional career from? My professional life really started in business because I started business when I was very small. I had a very small shop in front of our house back home when I was growing up. But my big brother was actually not happy. He said, if he's exposed to money so early, if I'm exposed to money so early, I will not finish school. 
So he had to close that shop. He had to close that business so that I could focus actually on the school. So when I finished, I then went back into business. When I finished high school, I went back into business because I was given a choice to either go to the university or travel. And I had my money, actually. I went, I started working very, very small and running businesses. So my professional life has always been, you know, just exposure to business. I came to South Africa and started my businesses when I was actually very, very small. And eventually, because of that exposure, I then found myself engaging with people who were doing the trade across borders. And that's how I then got introduced into the chamber space uh, in 2010. I got introduced to the German Chamber and the French Chamber of Commerce here in South Africa. And I've not looked back. So I have been with the Chambers of Commerce since 2010. And I have also developed the skills, you know, being a strategist, promoting trade, investment, but also being a creative. I'm a film producer. I taught myself filmmaking. I, I've never studied film uh, before. I believe I'm a storyteller. And I have really done quite a few things, you know, in my in my professional life, producing films, producing content. And I'm actually back now producing, working on a film actually around COVID in Africa. Um, so I, I live, I think, a very exciting life whereby I'm not boxed into just one space. I am able to navigate different spaces, you know, media, entertainment, technology, innovation, healthcare, and just my exposure to cultural diversity has also helped me to work and communicate across cultures. So my professional life is made up of starting the journey as an entrepreneur, engaging into the diplomatic space, working with chambers of commerce, you know, trade attaches at various embassies, uh, India, for example, you know, looking at the legacy relationship that India has with South Africa from the BRICS perspective with Brazil, Russia, uh, and China. My life really has not been kind of a, like a straight line, you know, there's been ups and downs, but I truly, truly enjoy the journey so far. And I'm looking forward to what comes next. So what were your initial days challenges when you started your professional journey? I think naturally not knowing English, South Africa, that was actually a very, very difficult thing. I don't think many people understand the challenges of living in a country that speaks English and you came in speaking French. So I would know in my head, I like, I know what I want to say, but I was actually failed by the ability to communicate in the language people don't understand. So that was actually a very, very big challenge I had to overcome. I had to teach myself how to speak English. I had to read books in, in English. I had to listen to radio, watch TV shows in English as well. So the biggest challenge really for me has been the language barrier. That was actually a very, very, very good challenge. So because of the commitment and passion I have to really develop myself, I then overcame that challenge by knowing the language. Sometimes I understand English more than people who are born speaking because I threw myself in wholehearted. That's the first thing. The second thing really is just the ability to raise money in a, in a country that kind of has adopted you. There are so many ideas that need a lot of money. I remember when I started producing films, I had to produce a film, then go and license it to a broadcaster. And if I make about three films, take them, they will take one film. It simply means that I have lost that money. I've wasted, actually, uh, I've lost money, I've wasted money. Those challenges as well. And uh, the kind of content I was also producing, because they, I love this proverb that says, you don't see the world as it is, you see it as you are. So the kind of content I was producing for South Africa was kind of something that was not trendy. It was not something that many, many people kind of understood because I wanted to bridge my culture where I came from with the South African culture to communicate really what happens literally for people like me who came outside of South Africa and made South Africa home. Uh, the difficulty of understanding that diversity, really, there are people who also make it their mission not to understand diversity. And that's actually a very, very difficult thing as well. The challenge of working with local government here I worked with the city of Johannesburg for a very long time. And when people assume they know who you are based on what they've read in the media or what they want to believe actually in the media. So there's been a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities, especially 
being out of your comfort zone kind of accelerates your growth, your learning as well. Um, so that that's basically what has been my my journey. So among all the sectors which you have been working, like media and government, technology, which one is your favorite? They actually complement each other. But tech is such a powerful force for good. If we look, for example, at the Sustainable Development Goals, you will see that technology is playing a role and media is also playing a role. Because when people don't know about something as big, as powerful as the Sustainable Development Goals, it is actually very, very difficult for them to evolve with it, to engage with it, to understand it. So media plays the role of getting people to know exactly what this powerful platform of the world we want is all about. I think media is my favorite, especially as an African. Media globally has not been our friend. We've been stereotyped for a very long time. Media, they say, has the power to make the guilty innocent, make the innocent guilty. Because of that power, I want to understand media because media has not been my friend. I think media is actually a very, very interesting platform for me. But having said that, if we look at the fourth industrial revolution now, we know that there were other three revolutions that happened. Now that's basically where my passion for technology comes in. We know that by 2051, in every four human being will be an African. How do we prepare Africa for that future? How do we prepare young people in this continent for that future? As a continent, 70% of the population is under the age of 30. That is what is called the demographic dividend. Now, for us to turn that demographic dividend into really uh, a very big opportunity, I think technology as an enabler will play a very critical role. So we don't want to leave anyone behind. We don't want to leave Africa behind. And I think that is the, the reason why now I'm playing that space with technology as a tool for, uh, for inclusion. Um, also technology for me, because we have a very, very big problem of joblessness, a lot of young people in Africa are employed, even here in South Africa where I am, I believe that by giving young people the tools, especially the tech and innovation tools, we will be able to help actually bridge the gap, bridge, bridge the divide. Uh, and tech for me makes the world very small. We, call, we speak about the world as a, as, a, as a village, global village. It means that you can be sitting in South Africa and basically you're working for a company in Silicon Valley. And I think that's something that India has actually managed successfully. And I say to people, we need to emulate the example of India. Literally, India leads Silicon Valley, right? Some of the top CEOs in Silicon Valley are from India. So South Africa, I mean, as you know, we have the second biggest population of Indians in the world, out, outside of India, right? As a, as a, as a nation. So we have a lot of similarity. You know, we belong to IPSA, the India, Brazil, South Africa platform belongs to BRICS. So there are so many things we can also learn from India and of course other members as well of, uh, of BRICS. I believe technology will bring this world closer, but I don't want to be, I don't want technology to leave us behind. Africans are innovative. Uh, there's been a lot of ideas that came out of this continent, so it's not enough. So I'm kind of between the two, between media and technology. <laughs> so you also play entrepreneurship role as far as the communication is concerned. So what are your day-to-day -day challenges as an entrepreneur? I think entrepreneurship is not a destination. Entrepreneurship is a journey. And every single day, we don't just discover what it is because it changes based on the leadership in the nation, based on the what's happening around the globe. If you see what's happening with Russia and Ukraine, it has a way to actually affect how you do business. We saw with COVID as the pandemic happened around the globe, uh, industries were shut down. It also uh, affected how people actually did business. So every single day as an entrepreneur with ideas in the marketplace, you are not always certain that this particular idea you have is going to be accepted by the marketplace. And I think entrepreneurship for me teaches you to be humble because what you think you know, you actually don't. So entrepreneurship for me, it is also a platform where we discover just what we have in 
who we are as human beings as leaders. So there are people who depend on me, you know, people who are working with me, working for me. And I also see entrepreneurship not just a means to an end. I see entrepreneurship as a tool that will help us develop the economy. So economic growth in Africa can happen only through innovation driven entrepreneurship. So that's the reason why I don't just do this as an entrepreneur, I'm also able to ignite the entrepreneurship potential of a lot of people, especially young people, but also of women. I want to become an example, but not like a complete or ready grow every single day. Uh, the challenges we encounter every single day can also uh, serve as, as lessons for people who are coming after us. Has it always been easy? No, nothing is easy. That's why I said entrepreneurship uh, is not a destination, but it is a change. So every single day, you are learning about yourself, you are learning about businesses, you are also learning about systems, you are learning about policy. Without proper policy in place, entrepreneurship cannot actually be tried. So as a chamber of commerce now, we want to make sure that we are able to help policymakers apply policy with implementation. The problem is not the lack of policy. We do have a lot of policies, but how do we implement those policies? So I wear multiple heads. One is an entrepreneur, but also an ecosystem builder. I am building the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Africa from Cape in South Africa here to Cairo, there in Egypt. So I'm playing the player and the referee, actually, if I have to put it that way. I'm an entrepreneur myself, but I'm also helping build a conducive environment where entrepreneurs can actually thrive. And one of the things we suggest in this chamber is the possibility of having a single policy on entrepreneurship in Africa. We have five countries, right? If you count Western Sahara. Now, every single country has a policy on entrepreneurship. Now, that is actually difficult. If we want to trade across borders, we have to get to the point where there is a policy, one single policy that actually can apply across the African continent. So that's basically, I think, as an entrepreneur, I'm also using the lessons that I've learned running my own businesses to also empower and showcasing what can be done, the potential of entrepreneurship as a tool for economic development, and economic growth, youth development, job creation. So there's so much, much, much more, especially as a continent, continent as big as ours, where the biggest challenge really has been the unemployment of a lot of young people here in Africa. So using entrepreneurship can also become a way of solving the problem of uh, joblessness. So where does you see Africa 20 years from now? 20 years from now, I see jobs created. I see young people empowered. I see Africa becoming the pride of the world, basically because the future Africa is not just the past of humanity and humankind. Africa is the future of humankind. That's why all of these people in technology, government, they know that. So what I see in 20 years time, I see Africa being the beacon of hope for humanity because people have never considered this continent to be anything. We know we came from colonialism, the slave trade happened, apartheid happened here in South Africa. I see in Africa that is emancipated economically, where the shackles or the chains of poverty have actually fallen, where jobs of the future, skills of the future develop. So I think for me, the next 20 years, I see really an Africa that is an influential player and partner in the world economy, but also shaping the agenda of humanity and humankind. Because we, like I said earlier on, we are not just the birthplace of humankind, we are also the future of humanity. But for that future to be here, we have to make sure that we empower young people, like my own children here, for them to truly own that economy of the future. We have to build institutions for them, we have to build businesses with them and for them, so that they are not found wanting, that they are not actually desperate, and they are leaving Africa. I also see the next 20 years, young people in Africa not having the desire to leave Africa. We know what's happening 
uh, up there in North Africa, you know, in, in, in Libya, where a lot of young Africans actually are dying crossing to Europe, where opportunities are supposed to be. So I want to be part of those people who will be able to build the infrastructure, the opportunities for industrialization, whereby these jobs, whereby these opportunities they are going to look for in Europe, in their backyard. That is literally my hope and wish really for the continent for the next 20 years. So what was the thought process behind starting Pan-Africa Chamber of Commerce? So the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce is an idea came in 2010. I was attending an event organized by a student from Congo at one of the universities here in Johannesburg, and they presented a problem after graduating in South Africa, graduating from some of the best universities. It was very difficult, if not impossible, for them to get a job, not just getting a job, for them to get work experience that comes through internship. So when I had this problem, the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce as an idea did not just happen overnight. It came out of a need to create opportunities for young people, not only from Congo where I'm coming from, but young people from other countries who are studying in South Africa, but also young South Africans as well, to help them build this bridge between the classroom and the boardroom, between learning and earning. So I saw that. I then eventually started speaking to people I knew uh, at the French embassy, and eventually the embassy referred me to the French uh, South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. This was 18 years ago. So spending time, French South African Chamber, and as you know, European Union Chambers of Commerce work very well together. I was then exposed to other chambers of commerce. So after spending about five years with these chambers, I realized that I did not have so much power to change what these chambers would do you know, in terms of transformation, but I could set up my own because I was faced with an African problem that needed an African solution. So the Pan-African Chamber was set up to solve the problem of joblessness. But how you solve that, it is actually to empower small businesses. It is actually by connecting them to markets so that they will then become platforms through which these young people can learn the skills for them to become employable. So they go to look for a job. They are told they don't have experience. How do you get experience without a job? Basically, it's a chicken and egg situation. So it is because of that. Secondly, it is just because of my passion to show to people in South Africa that there's so much to this continent than this beautiful country called South Africa. A lot of young people in this nation don't always look to Africa. They look to Europe. They look to America. It has been like this because of where the nation is coming from. When the apartheid system was in place, it really did not want black people in South Africa to acknowledge their Africanness, right? They were told that they are not really part of this continent and stuff like that. So for me, the passion of connecting people and also of showing young people from South Africa that there is so much, much more to Africa than South Africa. From a numbers perspective, South Africa is about 60 million people, but the entire continent is 1.4 billion people. Now, there is strength in numbers. I wanted to make sure that I'm able to show these young people, these entrepreneurs, that your power, the future of your business, doesn't lie just in you being a South African, doing business in South Africa. It lies in the ability of you to communicate across borders. That is basically how the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce was established. Thirdly, the Chamber was established to give a place to African women to thrive and run business. African women are at the bottom of the economic value chain. They are overworked, they are underpaid. So we wanted to make sure that as the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce, we can work with the private sector and the public sector, mainstream women's economic participation. Basically, that's how the Chamber came about. Fourthly, I am really passionate about culture. I wanted to make sure that Pan-African Chamber of Commerce as an organization can drive the economic transformation in Africa through cultural development. So those are the areas where we set the chamber uh, to solve some of the issues, the key issues we're facing as a continent, but primarily it came out of the need to provide an opportunity to young people in Africa, again, work experience, for them to become employable, also looking at how we can work with institutions of high learning to provide skills required by the marketplace for these young people to become employable. So those are the reasons that made me set up the chamber and I fell in love with this space. I don't see myself doing anything else. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's why we set up the chamber. So what all things can anybody expect when he approaches Pan-African Chamber of Commerce? 
when people approach the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce, they, they should expect a network. They should expect an ecosystem that starts from idea to market. And when we speak of this market, it's not just an African market, it is a global market. Like I said at the beginning, the world has actually become a village, very, very small village. As an African, I know that it takes a village to raise a child. So when you join the Pan-African Chamber of Commerce, you are actually meeting a group of like-minded people who are passionate about driving economic transformation and development in Africa. Secondly, people are joining an organization that is truly, really connected and informed about what's happening in the world today. We know what's happening within the BRICS countries and we see so many other countries wanting to join. We know what's happening at the G20 level. South Africa is hosting the BRICS conference. India is hosting the G20 summit. So there is a lot of things that we are able to bring. The other thing people are going to join actually when they meet the chamber is access to information. They say information is power, but I always believe it is information that is applied, knowledge. They say knowledge is power, but this knowledge actually needs to be applied. So when people join the chamber, they're joining an institution that is knowledgeable, not just about the present conditions or the presence of actually what we're doing as a continent in the big scheme of things globally, but they're also joining an organization that is very, very well informed in terms of where the economy is going. The other thing they are going to be meeting, joining the chamber, is an innovative organization, an innovative organization that believes that trade is global, we need to empower people with skills they need really uh, to compete in this global economy that is driven by technology and innovation. That is basically what they are they are meeting. They are also meeting an organization that is passionate about youth and women development. I know that when you hear a film like Titanic, they'll say women and children first, right? As a chamber of commerce, we truly believe that the world economy is in turmoil. I think we need to we need to invest in children, but also we need to invest in women. So they are meeting an organization that is passionate about women empowerment, economic empowerment, and youth development. Lastly, it's really an organization that is championing the role of culture in diplomacy and cooperation. I think chambers of commerce traditionally, every single one of them that I know, have never taken the time to look into the role of culture in economic development. So because of my passion being a creative myself, I have made our chamber innovative using culture as a tool for economic development. So those are the things they are going to meet when they actually come and uh, yeah, see this uh, organization I set up. So does Pan-African Chamber of Commerce also help in import and export if somebody approaches you? Yes, definitely. So we don't really do import export. We do that through the members of our organization. We belong to a number of business trade investment networks. So there is capacity there. We'll actually be able to point people in the right direction. So if somebody wants to do business with us, want to do business in Africa, we can also connect them to various African embassies in different parts of the globe, because I think it's actually a very good place to start. So if somebody wants to do business in South Africa, let's say they are in India, they can go to the South African embassy so that the embassy is then able to state them, these are the priority sectors. This is exactly where South Africa want to go as a nation, want to grow, and they will then use that information as a tool to grow and develop their businesses. So as president of the Black in Technology South Africa, what are your roles and responsibilities? So I've been leading Blacks in Technology South Africa since 2021. It is a US-based foundation. I have set more chapters as well in Botswana, in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, in Tanzania. My responsibilities in South Africa are really to use technology as a tool for economic inclusion. Technology in South Africa is led by white South African men. That's what is happening here. And we want to make sure that the face of technology should not be the face of a particular color. 
we want to make sure that when you mention technology, you can as well be in technology being black. And you can also be in technology being white. So what we are trying to do now is to change the face of technology. So the future of humanity is tied to the future of technology. Therefore, it cannot only be a forte of a particular race. So my job is to make sure that we bring the private sector, we bring the public sector, but also we bring young people coming out of universities to acquire the skills they need to compete, to become employable, and to set up their own businesses, to compete actually in the global uh, marketplace. So those are just some of the, the few uh, roles I play uh, in, in, in Blacks and Technology in South Africa. But I'm also setting up the Blacks and Technology Academies as well. Because if we need to build an inclusive society using technology, we have to make sure that we provide young people, young South Africans, young Black South Africans, the skills they need to become employable, the skills of the future. So coding, they need to understand artificial intelligence, they need to understand gaming. There is a lot of things, cyber security and all of that. So. That is one of the things we're going to be doing as Blacks and Technology South Africa to empower them to be competitive in the marketplace. So how has been your journey from steering committee member to founder and chairman, Pan-African Chamber of Commerce? The journey has really been exciting. It has been a challenging journey because you discover new things every single day. Organizations grow when they come in contact with other organizations. I think as, a, as an entrepreneur, I'm leading this chamber as an entrepreneur. I stepped down in 2020 as a CEO, focused now on building the chamber from behind. The journey has been really exciting. I have grown mentally. I've grown as a creative because the chamber has exposed me to every single sector of the, of the economy. I know what's happening in agriculture now. I know what's happening in technology. I know what's happening in construction. I know what's happening in education. So the chamber has helped me grow so much as a person because I need to be informed. It has also helped me to step out of my comfort zone because I need to read. I need to know what's happening out there. I always say, if you don't read, you can't lead. And basically, I have really grown so much as a person because of the Pan-African Chamber being the chairman I've been invited to wine and dine with, uh, <laughs> with authorities. I've been invited to the, the G20, you know, through the T20 uh, platform. I've been invited to partner with the BRICS Business Council. I've been invited to partner with international development organizations. And of course, these global chambers of commerce, you know, we've signed MOUs, a number of them. And really, it has really helped me grow as a person but also made me realize that the world as we know it is not the same. And you need to adjust and adopt, adapt as you go along. And yeah, I have really grown so much. But my influence as well has grown beyond just in the chamber with organized businesses, with government as well. People know my passion for economic transformation. The chamber has given me a new mandate uh, in life. And it's really directly linked to what my mission in life is. My mission in life is to disrupt injustice, is to challenge inequality, but it's also to inspire an ambitious vision of what Africa can be. So this is something that I discovered when I came to South Africa, but also something that I've learned as well to grow with every single day as, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a change maker. So from your journey, what was the most challenging phase? I think for my journey, the challenging thing has been working with people who don't understand you. As a leader, you are maybe 10 miles ahead. So you need to be patient. You need to actually make sure that people join you on this journey because it's not a personal journey. It should be a collective journey. So when people don't understand where you want to go as a leader, it is really frustrating. When people don't understand where you want to take them, because you cannot take people on a journey, they are not excited to be on. It is going to be very difficult. 
it is going to be tiring, but it's also going to be very stressful. So as a leader, you also learn to be patient. So I've always said to my team, if you realize that I'm running faster, tell me to slow down. So some people have told me to slow down and they don't tell me when to pick up pace again. And I think those are the challenges of being a leader when you're leading people. So just getting people along, you know, taking people along. Um, I've had to do things alone because many, many, many times people did not understand exactly what we were planning to do. So when we started the chamber, when I started the chamber eight years ago, I gave membership for free, right? I saw what other chamber performers were doing. I saw that they depended entirely on their members for survival. They realized that for a new organization in the marketplace, convincing people that we are a worthy investment was actually very, very difficult. And at my age has also been a problem, very big problem. I remember somebody saying to me in Algeria in 2016, from the Cameroon Chamber of Commerce, he said to me, you are too young to run a chamber of commerce. You are too young. Now that's a problem. But we speak about ages, not only from us, it's young people, it's young Africans, young entrepreneurs looking at people been around for a very long time. And many times we don't believe or they should belong. But there are people in Africa who doubt you, not because of the ideas you have in the marketplace, but literally because of your age. That's one. Two, it is when people from South Africa um, are coming across me, just me, people who are coming from outside of South Africa, and they already have a preconceived notion of what we are here for, right? That preconceived notion is that we are here to make a quick buck and run. <laughs> and you realize that, no, if I wanted to make a quick buck, I would have made a quick buck a long time ago. Uh, so it is those things as well, uh, cultural acceptance, uh, when people know you're coming from this place, and of course they realize that you're already in that space. Some are going to resist wanting to know why are you here? What are your intentions? What are your plans? Are you here just to steal from us and go? Yeah, those have actually have been very, very difficult as well. And just knowing that sometimes the people you are leading, people you want good for, don't understand what you want as a leader. And I think the frustration, not just by people from here, people from literally everywhere. South Africa is a nation. When they see a black person in a position of power, it's not normal because black people are supposed to be saving white people. So black people in this nation have also adopted that mindset that a black person is actually not supposed to be in a position of power. So we are not just fighting racism, we are fighting the legacy of racism that has been adopted by people who look like me. So those are the challenges we face here. So from your professional journey, what's that one thing you love about your professional journey the most? I love meeting new people. I'm always excited. I remember somebody came to ask for advice from me. They wanted to set up a chamber of commerce. I asked them one simple question. I said to them, are you a people's person? Are you a people's person? They, they were confused. Like, Am I supposed to be? I said, yes, you're supposed to. Be. So if you cannot smile, as the Chinese say, you should not sell anything so i have grown you know in leaps and bounds as a person but networking is something that i love dearly really meeting new people because every single person we meet has something to teach us so when i meet new people yesterday i was at an event about scaling up um i go to learn as well so i think my professional journey has really helped me for a person who is hungry for knowledge to continuously grow. And I think beats the ability to meet new people, learn things together, and also just enjoy life, really. So apart from your father and Nelson Mandela, sir, who is your mentor in your professional journey? So in my profession, 
the mentors really have been the people I had to lead. I know we don't always look at that relationship that way. I've learned so much from the people I was leading because they're coming in with their culture, they're coming in with what they know, they're coming in with their own assumptions. So they've actually taught me so much. I would observe my actors, everything I know about leadership, I learned it really in business. I learned it also as a filmmaker because it's sometimes in the production, you can be leading about 20, 30 people. Every single one of them depends on you. And as they depend on you, you need to guide them. You need to show them the way. And that's how I've been able to grow. So my biggest mentors, apart from Nelson Mandela, who's a role model, a hero of mine, and my father, of course, has been the people I've had the privilege of leading, but also my own children. I've learned so much. The first thing I learned through my children is unconditional love. I didn't know what that was until I had children. They just loved me for being me. Not because of what I, I I could give them, but just just being their father has, has really been my the exciting the exciting thing for my life really. So I learned from my children, I learned from the people I I lead, but also I learned from influencers, you know, people in the marketplace, you know, in business, uh, entrepreneurs who are role models, um, church leaders. There has been so many role models over the course of my business journey. So what does leadership mean to you? And according to you, what are the quality of a good leader? I think leadership for me is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. A leader needs to see the way, but a leader needs to walk the way, needs to show the way. So you are influencing people positively. You are not influencing people negatively. One of the things I've learned is that when you have power, you need to use it, but don't use it to destroy people. Use that power to build people. I also don't take the fact that people are always following me. I don't take that for granted. I always want to know what do they want from me? What are their expectations? Can I meet these expectations? Can I exceed these expectations? So for me, leadership is about influence. Leadership is about impact. I want people's lives to change. I want there to be a before and after me. So what I've learned really is that leading people is really not just about what you want as a person. Leading people is about what we want, our generation actually. So I look at it from that perspective to say, the leaders who came before us, what did they do? What lessons can we learn from them? And how can we leave this place, the world, a better place than the one we found? So that has always been my biggest kind of inspiration, really, as a leader. So what advice would you like to give to young entrepreneurs? The advice I need to give to entrepreneurs is that Rome was not built in one day. They need to consider entrepreneurship as a journey and not a destination. It's not just about the money they want to make, they will make. But it's also about understanding who you are as you grow through this journey. They need to be patient with themselves. Entrepreneurship is not sexy. Entrepreneurship is not what we see in Hollywood movies. Entrepreneurship is real life. And this life has ups, this life has downs. So entrepreneurs need to be very, very patient with themselves. They must not copy everything they see out there. A lot of these people who are here talking about their success, many of them actually are not telling the truth. So they have to be patient with themselves. This journey requires courage. It also requires commitment. It requires passion. You need to be passionate about entrepreneurship because that journey is going to be enjoyable. What are do's and don'ts you should remember while starting your professional journey? I think Starting a professional journey should be about the process. It should not really be just about the money you want to make. Of course, you need to begin with the end in mind, but you really need to enjoy that journey. So the first thing is really understanding why you started. Why are you there, right? Is it for the right reason? Is it for the wrong reason? 
So understanding why you start anything actually has the capacity to help us enjoy that change, by the way. So what needs to be done is really to be passionate. It is also to be very well informed about that particular sector, that particular industry. You need to have as much information as possible. Like me, I have experience working with other chambers of commerce. That experience prepared me now to run my own chamber. I've experienced producing films, content for a while now. It also helping me now to kind of get into a different market. Study, 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 study. Understanding the sector, but also quite importantly, understand why you started it. You started in that space. So what would be your suggestion to students who are first time entering the professional world? I think they need to have mentors. They need to have people who can direct them. They need to have people who have walked the journey because those people have experience. So one of the things I say to students, and I'm giving you an example. I worked with students from the film and television industry here in South Africa, but also across the continent. Many of these students believe that having the degree or the certificate is enough. That's not enough. You actually need to develop the business acumen. So be patient with yourself, find mentors, find sponsors, find people who can open doors for you, find people who have been where you wanna go because they have the lived experience and they can help you maneuver the space, maneuver that space, that particular industry. So as much as you're studying and learning about that particular industry, you need to find role models in every and they are always available. But most of these people, uh, even though they're very busy, they always have time to invest and to basically pay it forward. So now we'll start our rapid round. Success in one line. Success is resilience. So if you want me to choose one thing to achieve success, which is luck, hard work and smart work, what is that one thing you will choose? I think it's hard work because Many, many people just want to get it easy. Nothing worth having comes easy. So hard work pays and we must never run away from it. Your favorite destination? I think Ethiopia is my favorite destination. My favorite destination. I love that country because of the history, the heritage, the culture. I think Ethiopia should be my favorite destination. Your favorite adventure? My favorite adventure will be really learning a new skill. Learning a new skill, learning a new language, really, that is a very good adventure. <laughs> Your favorite actor and actress? I think Lupita Nyong'o is, uh, is my favorite actress. She's, a, she's an African. But also my favorite actor should be Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is one of the top actors that I, yeah, Every single time he's in a movie, I really want to watch it. <laughs> Your favorite color? Blue is my favorite color because it represents infinity. So when you look, for example, at the sky, the sky is blue. Blue for me represents limitlessness. When you look at the ocean, according to me, the ocean is blue. So it is also limitless. So that's the reason why I love blue as a color. So which is your favorite country apart from South Africa and Africa? My favorite country, apart from South Africa, I think it should be Ethiopia also, again. I think it should be Ethiopia because I love, I love history so much. Every single time I'm in Ethiopia, I feel like I am reborn again. <laughs> yeah, I think apart from South Africa, it is Ethiopia. So last question, one line that defines you. I am, I am resilient. This is something that my daughter actually, I say to her, how do you describe me? She said, you are re resilient. So that is really what defines me. I'm resilient with them. So thank you very much for your precious time and doing the conversation and sharing, especially the advices and challenges from your life journey. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye, Pram.